Hello and welcome to the Dig in Denver podcast, a podcast for the people by the people. I am your lovely co-host, Derek, joined today as usual uh, by Logan Parks. Mr. Parks, welcome in. We also do have this season a new co-host of the Dig in Denver podcast. The new co-host is going to be Brennan Vogt. Brennan, go ahead and tell people a little bit about yourself. Hey, thanks, Derek. What's going on, guys? I'm Brendan, guys and gals, I should say. I am the new co-site admin at Dig in Denver, and I'll be helping you guys out, hopping on and hosting the podcast when I can. And I'm uh, stoked to talk a little Nuggets basketball with you guys. Where can the good people find you at, Brendan? They can find me on Twitter at BVOGT422. That's BVOGT422. You could follow that. Make sure you're following the site Twitter handle as well. That's at Dig in Denver. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, excited to have you and uh, definitely doing a lot of good for the site, so we appreciate you very much. Glad to be here, man. Glad to be on board. Uh, next up, we do have a special guest, the first time on the Dig in Denver pod. He's been doing a ton of great for us this offseason, covering the practices for us and doing a lot of good stuff, and that is the man Brandon Ewing. Brandon, how's it going? Good, Derek. How's it going, man? Thanks for letting me hop on. Yeah, definitely, man. I'm glad to have you here. Uh, go ahead and tell people a little bit about yourself and where they can find you at. Yeah, man, I'm just uh, covering the nuggets this season with you guys digging denver it's my first uh season really covering an nba team or doing anything like this so i'm super excited and uh you guys can follow me on twitter at b skip 17 but there's an underscore in there so it's b underscore skip 17 and i'll be uh going to some of the practices covering some of the games and i'm excited to be working with you guys Awesome, gentlemen. Awesome, gentlemen. Well, there's a little bit about us, everybody. What we're going to be talking a little bit today is uh, about the preseason. We're going to talk about some of the uh, positional battles that were going on, some of the things that we saw, you know, obviously the pairing between the almighty Jokic and Paul Millsap, seeing how that went. We're also going to be doing a little bit of preview for this upcoming season that everyone's so excited about. So, without further ado, let's dig in. Check this out. Yo, dressed in a digitous garb, sit in the bar. The words that I used to be all people applaud. Now watch how the brother adapt, fill in the gaps, perhaps. I played the block until the curb collapsed. Now check the method and put the message on record. Promote the effort and change the neighborhood preference. And keep them guessing from the old to the Let's start right at the top, the positional battles. The main one that everyone's really, really talking about and a lot of interest has peaked in is the point guard position. The point guard battle was going down between Emmanuel Moutier and the young Jamal Murray. Uh, we had a couple of people starting, had a couple of good games from each one of them, showing some flashes here and there. Uh, let's just get right into it. Brennan, what do you think about the uh, the point guard battle this preseason so far? Well, it seemed to me, guys, that the Nuggets at least wanted Moutier to win this job to some extent. And I say that just based off how many chances this kid keeps getting. Yes, he's obviously still young. The upside's still there. But time and time again, it seems like Malone has gone out of his way to get Moutier looks with the first unit. Um, I think that's because he has the best profile to become a plus defender. Obviously, he's huge and strong and athletic for his position. Um, And I think he has more of a traditional point guard skill set than, say, a Jamal Murray. Um, That said, his assist-to-turnover ratio has plagued him his whole career, albeit a short one. And that's what they were looking to see him make a big improvement in this preseason. And I don't think he did it, guys. Um, His his shooting wasn't good enough. His turnovers were were they were just happening way too often. Um, So I think we're in a weird position where Moutier entered the preseason with a chance to be named the starter. Now, guys, I think he's going to be all the way down at the bottom of this depth chart with Jameer Nelson coming in off the bench because I think Malone's got to start Murray. But that's just me. Yeah, definitely. It, it was, you know, with, with Emmanuel, the, the whole problem has always been his turnovers. Um, his assists have always been decent. You know, his his scorings, it, it's off and on, but it can definitely be there. But it's, it's just the turnovers. That's that's his biggest uh, issue that he's had so far in his young career, like you were talking about, Brennan. Um, I, I really like the kid. I, I wish he would develop because of his defensive upside. Um, you know, I, I don't really know. What uh, what do you think, Logan? What were your thoughts on this uh, this preseason? Yeah, I think in the preseason, we definitely figured out that Jamal Murray did win the battle. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't like he won the battle. It was more like Moutier lost it. And with, and with Jameer Nelson not really being able to play much with his injuries, he wasn't really – I don't think he ever really had a shot at the starting point guard. We want one of our young guys to be one of the starting point guards. And I think Jamal Murray has won that battle, and I think that – Moutier will have a chance to at the beginning of the season uh, just 
kind of like they did it last year. They gave him a little bit of a shot for the first 20 games maybe. And I think they're going to do that again, see if he does have the possibility to become our backup or maybe even take the spot over uh, from Jamal Murray. But it's, it's going to be a tough road for him. He's going to have to prove a little bit more consistency than he has in his career. We've obviously seen some really good flashes from him. And as Nuggets fans, it makes you want to believe in him when you see him go off and make a great play and make a really athletic play on both ends of the floor. And then the next play down, he does a turnover. It's, it's just it's tough to watch as a fan, but it's also exciting. It's just it's hard. It's hard overall because we all want the guy to be great, but uh, he doesn't really have it right now, and hopefully he can figure that out soon. So uh, the positional battle is a little less clear. I think the less clear it is for us, the better, because both those guys playing good basketball will really help this team in the long run. Hey, Brandon, you and I uh, worked together on a roundtable piece with our newest contributor, Danny Kay. We talked about this very thing, the position battle, the point guard battle. I believed, I believe you picked Jamal Murray to start. Am I right? Yeah, I, I totally agree with what you said earlier, man. They totally gave Moutier the chance in uh, training camp and everything. Everything we heard from Malone is he was running well with both the first and the second teams. But in those first couple of preseason games, the turnovers definitely plagued him. It seemed that he was just almost trying to do too much at times. And that's the same with Jamal Murray because when he was out there, he was almost trying to do too much at times. And it seemed like both were kind of pressing a little bit. But uh, I definitely think Jamal should be the starter to start the season just because of his his upside as a player and his turnovers definitely cut down towards the last few preseason games. And I wouldn't honestly be surprised if Jameer Nelson started some games because Malone likes veterans. Uh, you know what you get when Jameer's in the game. He's steady as can be. And, uh, but I definitely think Moutier dropped all the way down to probably third on the depth chart, and it's going to be mostly Jamal and Jameer getting the point guard minutes to start the season, and it'll be kind of interesting to see how the Coach Malone divvies up the minutes in the first few uh, regular season games. That's an interesting point, Brandon, and it's one that I don't think a lot of Nuggets fans like to hear, but I would stress is, is not a bad thing, and that's Jameer Nelson maybe starting. Um, Malone likes to see the traditional point guard play out of his one. I was at practice today, and he stressed that there's a difference between sticking Jamal Murray at point guard and having Jamal Murray learn how to play the point guard position. It's something they're still working on with him. And I think, like I said earlier, that's why you saw Malone uh, maybe so eager to try to get Moutier in that starting role. And that's, you know, Murray can light it up. He has by far the highest offensive upside of the three we've mentioned. Um, but yeah, he's not an NBA point guard. And so, you know, we saw in the second half of last season as Moutier went down with the back injuries, this is a young team that's so turnover prone that Malone felt most comfortable giving the keys to Jameer Nelson, who's probably the best assist to turnover ratio guard that's going to get significant minutes this year. So I agree with you, Brandon. The conversations Moutier Murray, Moutier Murray, that's kind of maybe only because Nelson was injured. Had he not been, he would have been fighting for that starting role. And yeah, it's possible he ends up in there before the year is up. Just with Nelson, he's played good in these last two preseason games as well. And when he runs the offense, he works well with both the first and the second unit. So he's kind of that. Yes, he's kind of that guy that Malone can use wherever he wants. And don't forget that he likes to use Will Barton at the one sometimes as well, because Will Barton kind of he likes putting him at that one, that two, and the three. So Will Barton can play some of those point guard minutes too. And you'll probably see Will Barton in there with Jamal Murray. He can stick him at the two. So that'll be a another interesting development to watch. One, one other good thing about the struggles that we're having at the point guard position is we're not as point guard dependent as a lot of other teams in the league. We're going to be generally operating our offense around uh, Nikola Jokic or Plumlee when he's in as the backup. We'll be able to operate out of the high post. We really just need our point guard to be able to get the ball up the court for us without turning the ball over. Unlike some other teams that are a little bit more dependent in their offense around their point guards, uh, we're not one of those teams, so it's going to be... I don't think the problem is as big as some people may think it is, uh, even though we all want our point guard to be great. Uh, I don't think it's as pressing as some of the other teams would have in this league. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that, man. Um, and I think why it's, you know, that's why you can get away with playing someone like Jamal Murray at the one, because like you said, you have Jokic, and you added a Millsap, right, who's the same kind of guy, can sort of play quarterback out of the elbows, the high post, um, 
so yeah, you you don't need that traditional point guard skill set as much as other teams. But I, I personally have just sort of noted how, how often Malone has stressed that over and over again, that despite Jokic, it still seems to me like he really values that type of skill set at the one, which is interesting. But that's why I, you know, I think that's why the 7,000-year-old Jameer Nelson is still in the conversation here. How comfortable are you guys with Jameer taking over the team for an extended period of time at all, being the starter? Uh, I I think that I'm pretty comfortable with it because I think that the Nuggets are kind of in a, a win now mode to start the season at a immediate day during Malone's press conference. He talked about how they've been six games under 500 to start the season the last two years after 20 games. So they definitely need to get a quick start because towards the end of last season, when they was getting down to playoff times, they, those games at the beginning of the season haunt them a little bit that they couldn't close out or lost by a few points just to, towards the end of the game. So I wouldn't be shocked, especially if Jameer got some minutes with the starters early in the season, just so we can, so they can get on a good track, start the season hot. And then that hopefully leads them into a successful season. Yeah, and if you're talking about playing it safe, right, in terms of getting it, getting off to a good start, maybe Jameer is the best option. I, I understand, you know, why people are so high on Murray, but um, I really like what he provided for this team last year. Just sort of that. Yeah, he takes some bad heat check shots. We'll see Jameer do that from time to time, but for the most part, he brings a certain poise and calmness to that position that um, a lot of this team doesn't have. So I'm perfectly comfortable with him running the offense in Denver. Um, He did it well last year, and, yeah, they missed the playoffs by one game, but you can't convince me that that's because of Jameer Nelson. So I'm I'm fine with it. Very good, yeah. Yeah, no, he definitely came in steady. There's a couple games where, you know, I mean, you can never blame one individual, but there's a couple games where he made some questionable decisions out of as a veteran point guard. But there's also a couple games where the only reason we stayed in that game was because of Jameer, his ability to shoot and pass and control the offense. So a little bit of both there. Right. I mean, when you're a young sort of like reckless offensive team searching for their identity and Moody is injured and your only real option at point guard is maybe more of a a scoring two guard in Murray and he's 20 years old and has a double sports hernia. Like, (laughs) there's a, you know, they had to turn to Jameer. And so, you know, I don't look at him as a limitation. I look at him and say, wow, what he did a pretty damn good job for someone at his age, considering what they asked of him. I don't think they'll have to ask as much this year, but when and if they do, yeah, this is a guy that can step up. Um, So, yeah, I, I think Logan made a great point. Like, the point guard position is the biggest question mark for this team, which would be a huge deal for just about any other team in the league. But I don't think it is for Denver. Nope. Our, our point guards are, are our centers. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's, how, that's how our team operates. But uh, So, all right. So everybody in contention, Jamal Murray's for starter? Agreed. I, yeah. Yep. I said Jamal Murray. I mean, it could, it could be Jameer, but it, it, it will be Murray, I think. Yeah, I mean, I could see at one point if if J- Jamal's, you know, struggling during the year, it, like uh, I think Brandon made the point of, you know, it switching up and him starting for a little bit. But, yeah, to start the season, uh, J- uh, Jamal for sure. Oh, I, I want to know I, I want to know if you guys would – who you would bring in in the second unit if Murray's starting. For me, it should be Jameer, and that's because, you know, spacing is so key in the modern NBA, and it's vital to Denver's success. So you're talking about the spacing in the second unit – well, if it's Moutier out there at the one, we all know that he can't shoot. So that kind of means you more or less have to get Trey Lyles in there at four, right? Because you need some spacing. Yes, Wancho helps a lot at the three, and it's not like, but it's not like Barton is a, a spot up scorer from the two guard. No, he's an ISO scorer. He scores with the ball in his hand. So you don't really have a lot of threats from the pre- perimeter beyond Wancho. Um, so if, if Moody is the backup to me, you, you almost have to play Trey Lyles. So I like Jameer for the fact that he spaces the floor a little better and he provides them with a little more flexibility because I think if Jameer is out there, then you can get away with playing for Reed a little bit more. Right. Yeah. That, and that's, I mean, you said it, the keys there is, is just who's, who's at, at that position, you know, that the other positional battle that was going on with Kenneth Reed and Trey Lyles, but I, I don't know. I personally like Moody there at the, at the backup. I, I just like the, the ability to score and get out in transition and kind of continue that offense going. Um, but like you said, it all just determines on who's out there on the court because he can be really hindered with the matchup and lineups. You know, we saw that with uh, Nurkic and um, Kenneth last year. It was, it was awful. Exactly. Right. 
Right, because Moutier is at his best when he drives to the rim, right? And he needs space to do that. Yeah, he has to attack. Exactly. So if it's if it's Fareed and Plumlee down there, he doesn't really have the space to do it. And it's not like you can just, if you leave Moutier out there as a spot-up shooter, I mean, he's a well below average NBA player if that's his role. So, What do you think, Brandon? Yeah, I really, I really just, I really think Jameer should be the backup to start the season. And I think that, in terms of the power forward spot, uh, I just recently wrote in our round table with Brendan and uh, Danny K. You mentioned him, our newest writer that uh, I would go with Lyles, but I really don't want to go with either of them. And Malone kind of sprinkled in a little bit of a nine man rotation in the OKC game against on uh, Tuesday. And it's kind of interesting to me, just taking Paul Millsap out towards the end of the first putting Wancho in, and then subbing Paul Millsap back in with the second unit. I think that it really just makes the offense flow a little better. But if they were to play a power forward, I would probably pick Trey Lyles just based on his upside. And like Brendan said, with the spacing of the floor, if you have Fareed and Plumlee down there, there's not going to be much room to drive or do anything, which is what Moutier's game is really based off of. And uh, if you if you have Jameer in there, he's really going to be able to space the floor on the outside. So... I don't know. I'm kind of just interested in the nine man rotation. What do you guys kind of think about that topic? If if I can jump in real quick here, because I was intrigued by that when I saw that you wrote it. Um, so I think one thing is that particular rotation I thought was a little matchup specific, or at least that's what I gathered from Malone's comments the next day after practice. Like he sort of really liked that lineup against that Thunder team. Um, Obviously, if Will Barton's going to play like that as a small forward, you, you flirt with the idea of sticking him there all year. But he, here's my objection, Brandon. Uh, this is a team that its best player, Nikola Jokic, is most heavily criticized for two things, his defense and his conditioning. And I don't think those two things are exclusive from one another. They're directly connected. So you've got Jokic, who's going to be probably the primary guy on offense in terms of touches. You've got this new aggressive defensive scheme. You're asking him to give you more on the defensive end than he has before. And now we're going to shorten up the rotation to just nine guys over the length of the year. I think your stress, you know, that's going to put a little too much on some of your star players. Um, Malone really feels like this is a deep team. So I'm intrigued by that idea, dude. But I, I, I think he's going to open it up a much more than that. Exactly. I agree a little bit. It is a little strenuous on the guys. So, but after what we saw in preseason and what I kind of saw in training camp going to a few practices, I really like Lyle's upside. I really like his upside with the team. He really, when I interviewed him at media day, he was really, uh, he really talked about how it was a great fit for him. It was a new fit. He loves how the ball moves around with the offense. And I think in Utah, he kind of was just, he was kind of stuck in their offense with Gordon Hayward. And, you, you know uh, what, you know what, Brandon, it's funny you say that the, the words he used to me were like stuck in a box. And he feels open and free here in Denver. So, yeah, not to jump in, but. Exactly. He really just stressed how he loved the fit here and he loved the free flowing offense and he just loved uh, the guys they have in place here and how, like, nobody's selfish. Everyone just wants to be successful. It's just a fun offense to play in. And I think that Fareed, man, it's just, I don't know, whatever he said to me today when he was mad about not starting and doing that stuff, I don't know if. We just want that on the team. He's a bit of a cancer in the locker room when you when you mention stuff like that. And Lyles just seems like he's a fresh fit. He's ready to play. So that's kind of why I want to see what he can do, opposed to Freed, which is what we've seen what he can do the last couple of seasons. Yeah, I think that uh, Lyles has worked really well with Plumlee in those first few games in that second unit. And Malone has stressed a lot about maybe not playing your best player, but playing the player that will get – uh, that fits best with the offense. And I think that might be Lyles in the second unit and being able to stretch it out. Like you guys were saying as well, would uh, really be helpful because we don't really have too much perimeter shooting in that second unit. When we have Murray, like we've been saying in the first unit with Gary Harris, who is one of our best three point shooters as well. And I, I think that like you were saying about the Kenneth Freed thing, it's going to be interesting to see how that moves forward because if he does want to be moved on, uh, us not playing him is not going to help his stock at all. So it's going to be interesting to see if they want to increase his stock before we can get him out of here or if we're just going to play with Lyles and someone that could be here for a while with his youth and his likeliness of Denver. He really likes being here, and I think that he'd be a really good fit going forward as well. 
Logan, I think you're spot on about fit versus talent there, man. Like Malone had said it himself, you know, it's not just about sticking the best basketball out player out there. It's about how well does he fit with the guys next to him. Um, and he's mentioned multiple times that he feels as if Lyles and Plumlee have developed some chemistry. Um, and at least on paper, their play styles mesh much better than Farid and Plumlee's. Neither of those two latter guys being jump shooters. So like we said earlier, no space. Um, as far as Fareed, you know, Brandon, I, I think this situation has a, has the chance to be potentially cancerous to this locker room. I wouldn't describe Fareed per, uh, himself as a cancer. He's, if you go to practice, or you know, at, at, yeah, I, and I'm sure that was just a slip of the tongue, but worth clarifying, you know, you watch him, like if you play body language doctor, he's a super, super engaged guy on the bench. This is a gamer. This is a guy who gives you everything he's got, whether he's starting or not. Um, I, I kind of liked those comments for him because I just felt like they were honest. I don't think he's going to quit. I don't think he's going to pout. I think he was just straight up about how he felt. Like he felt like he's an NBA starter. Um, that said, yeah, I mean, this guy's probably going to be traded, right, for several reasons. One, he said he believes he should be a starter. He obviously won't be. Um, two, they have one too many power forwards on this team as it is. And three, he's got a sizable contract that they would like to move. And, uh, you know, to help free up some room for that inevitable Jokic extension. So, yeah, you know, we'll th- we'll reference that roundtable piece one more time, Brandon. The last section was most likely player to be moved, and we all agreed it's it's Kenneth Fareed. Yeah, I totally agree. It's definitely Fareed. And a big thing is uh, Logan kind of talked about it, but the fit with uh, Plumlee, that's definitely a big thing Malone's been stretching. And Fareed played a lot with Jokic last year, and they were pretty good together. So Fareed and Plumlee – not really meshing to start well and Lyles and Plumlee meshing. I think that's what, what for me puts Lyles over the top of uh, Fareed. But like you said, Fareed is definitely an engaging player off the bench. He's a higher energy guy they can put in when they need it. So he's definitely a viable piece on the team. It's just be interesting to see how the situation goes moving forward and who Malone gives those backup power forward minutes to and when he uses Fareed and Lyles in certain situations. Well, yeah, and just just like we were talking, for all the talk we've had about Jamal Murray being the starter, Amanda Moody is in a similar situation where just because he's not the starter, just because he may not be second, doesn't mean he doesn't have a big role for this team. Um, you know, there's going to be times where we need him, just like, you know, with the whole Fareed situation. He's a high energy guy that can really get that uh, a mopey offense moving again. Um, I, I think Kenneth can still do a ton of good on this team. I've said it a couple times to a few people about how his situation reminds me of the Nurkic situation last year, that if he can learn to accept a lesser role, and be unselfish and really buy into this team, then, you know, he can have a tremendous career here this next year, um, you know, or, or for the remainder of his career with the Nuggets until, you know, the possibility of moving or whatnot. Um, but it all, well, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out for sure. But since we're talking what, what, so much, go ahead. Sorry, I just, one last point to make about Fareed, though, for everything I just said about him likely to be traded, um, this is a guy who sort of the shift of the way this game has been played over the last three to four years um, he's really suffering from that. We're going to see that now as they try to move this guy who I think we would all agree three, four years ago should have been and would have been easy to trade. Uh, who's really going to want him now? And that's that's not a, a, a comment on his abilities, um, rather his fit in the modern NBA. He's the furthest thing from a stretch four. So yeah, like you'll take that sort of that energy on the boards off the bench but he, he himself said he thinks he's a starter. So that's going to be a fascinating situation. Is like, you know, you'd think trading Fareed would just be, it'd be a very easy thing to do in NBA 2K, but it's going to be much harder to do in real life. Yep. Yeah, Logan and I had a similar conversation just about that. And, and you know, Logan always said that we should have traded, um, or his, I should say it this way, his highest trade value was after the Olympics game, after he won, when all that hype was about him and he was having a, you know, a heck of an Olympic Games. Um, but now, especially since the last few years and, and the decline of, of the, the use for his type of play is it's going to make it, you know, it's not like there's a lot of teams who are going to, you know, gravitate towards, I think, and I think me and Logan both agree on this one. I think like a, like a Cleveland could probably pick him up or somebody like that, that could use a higher energy guy, you know, back up for Tristan, um, something like that, but there's not going to be a heck of a lot of teams that are out there. No. And, and that, you know, he's, he's set to make almost $13 million in base salary this year. Um, and, and next year as well, it's going to be close to 14. So it's like, yeah, Fareed's a good player, but do you want to give $14 million 
to a guy who at this point you'd be struggling to figure out how to keep him on the floor. So just something to think about. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, excellent point there. So do you guys think that Trey Lyles is the backup? Do you think he won that positional battle? I don't know if he, I, I, if he won it, I think it's by default. Can I say that? Uh, cause I, I just think the Fareed situation is sort of, um, um, unfolding itself, right? I think we kind of know what where, what direction that's headed in. He's probably going to be traded. And so I, I've wondered how much of Malone talking up this this Lyles Plumley fit is genuine, you know, based off what he's seen in practice and in games versus like, I better talk this up because this is the game plan for better or for worse. And we traded for this guy on draft night. So <laughs> time to start making it sound better than it is. Yeah, adding on to that, I don't know if actually Lyles really won the job or if based based on his fit with Plumley and what Malone has talked about in all of practices and after games and stuff, I think that's what is going to win him the backup job because both Fareed and Lyles, they put up not great stats in the preseason games. When you look at it, Fareed actually put up better stats in the preseason than Lyles did. And, uh, yeah. So I really just think it's going to be based on fit alone. Fit with I think fit's a big thing with Malone, and it's something he's stressed in all the times we've talked to him after practices and stuff. He's a big fit guy, and I think I agree with him because chemistry is a lot bigger than potential, and he wants a team that has chemistry. He wants a team that flows on the court, and that's something you have with Lyles and Plumlee with that second unit. Yeah, I definitely agree with you guys, but I think this position might be a little bit – uh, tougher to decide because I think we know a little bit more about the point guard battle, who won that one just because uh, Moody really did not play very well during the preseason, so we kind of know that Murray's going to be there. But with this backup situation, if I'm watching the first game and I see Kenneth off the bench, I would be just as surprised if I saw Lyles off the bench. I really have no idea who's going to start this one. And I think the first game, or maybe the first few games, he might rotate it this, see which is working better uh but it, it's it's going to be an interesting one moving forward and i'm going to be really intrigued to see who comes off the bench first at, at that power forward spot yeah i would imagine that we're going to see i agree with you logan i think we're going to see a lot of alternating in the beginning here It's, it's uh, <laughs> once again, just another mystery going into the season. But uh, but what do you guys think? We we haven't really touched about it at all, but we saw Wancho a little bit jumping in there, and uh, I, I thought he looked pretty good. Do you guys have any thoughts about that? I love... Go ahead. Yeah, I got you. I loved when... Uh, I just love Wancho's shooting stroke, man. He is so smooth, and he's just a great catch-and-shoot kind of guy. And I even thought that he showed some great potential on the defensive end of the floor in preseason. He had a lot of energy which is something I think the Nuggets defense needs and something they're stressing with the more aggressive play style they're using. And he had a, some, a few block shots in the preseason, which uh, really ignited the team off the bench. And I don't know, man, I just love how he can stretch the floor. I think he's a great fit with this team, and I'm excited to see him get a lot more minutes this season than he did last season. I would like to echo everything Brandon just said. Um, as far as guys, it's like you want to talk about fit, on a roster like Wancho in Denver is just perfect right um, this is a team that's looking to add shooting depth they would like to end up with a team where at all times they're surrounding Jokic with deadly shooting and um, you know I, I liked what Adam Mara said about you know his breakdown of Wancho he's not ever going to profile as a star and that's probably a good thing like he add, he'll he add so much value by just doing what he does best versus trying to do any much more than that. You know, this is a glorified role player, but, you know, sometimes we hear the term role player and we we ascribe a negative connotation to that. Um, and I think that that's the, a backwards way of looking at it. These are roles that need to be filled and he fills this one quite, quite well. Um, I will say about the minute situation, if, if you're those wondering, you know, all these power forwards on this team will Wancho play. I asked Malone about that and he agreed that if he does play, it will have to be at the three. Um, luckily there are like, there's about 0.75 genuine threes on this team. So, 
Uh, there should be minutes for Wancho at the small forward. The question will be, can he defend at that level, et cetera? But yeah, I mean, this guy is is one of my favorite players in the league, actually. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that uh, to go off of that point about the, him playing the three, I think, I know he came into the league as a power forward, but I almost like him more at the three. And I think this loaded power forward spot might actually be good for him into developing into a more of a small forward than a power forward. Because, I mean, his biggest problem is defending uh, the small forward, but he can't really defend the power forward either with most of them being bigger than him. I think he's a little bit faster than he is big, so I think he has a little bit better chance of guarding the small forwards in the league than the power forwards. And I think him moving to the small forward might actually be better for him, uh, being able to stretch the four out a little bit better not having to rely on getting boards as much, just being able to be out there uh, and ready to knock down some shots for us. I'll disagree a little bit there, man, in that um, if we're talking two, three years down the line when Juan Hernan Gomez may be considered for, you know, a starting spot, um, I agree with you that like naturally from a build wise, he's more of a three than a four, but in the NBA, can he guard threes? So like, yeah, I get what you're saying that maybe it looks like he he's better suited to guard threes than big guys, but there's a lot more dangerous threes in this league. You know, being being a starting small forward means you're guarding Jimmy Butler, Paul George, uh, you know, Carmelo, LeBron, Durant, you name them. So I don't know if he can do that versus where if he's a, a true four in two or three years. You know, everyone would like a four that stretches the floor a little bit, like a Trey Lyles. How about a four like Wancho that you can literally leave him beyond the arc exclusively? And the defense has a choice now. I mean, are we going to go out there and guard him? Because if we don't, he'll hit the shot. If we do, the paint's open. So to me, I like him better at the four for those reasons. Brandon, what do you think? I think it'll be interesting to see where Malone uses him. Like you said, there's literally no small forwards on the roster really besides Wilson Chandler. And I know that Will Barton uh, will get some of those minutes at the three, but Wancho's defense will definitely be the big question with him because I don't think his offense is ever going to be a question. He's a great fit in the offense. He's always going to be able to hit those spot up threes. He'll drive when you need him. He can hit the mid range. His uh, just his defense staying within the quicker threes, uh, guarding the bigger guys at the power forward position. I think that's something to just wait to be seen. It's something we're going to have to watch this season and see where he projects better towards through the middle of the season and towards the end of the year, whether he's going to be a small forward or a power forward going forward. Because I think that he can fit, he probably fits better on this team right now as a small forward, but over time with what could happen and he's going to get a starting spot, like you said, in probably these next few years, it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens. So there was the game against OKC last year where he had, you know, that that dominating performance on the defensive end against KD. I don't want to say shut him down, but he definitely – OKC. Wow, Golden State. You're right. My bad. Uh, Golden State, I've been corrected. Uh, but it was against that game, and he was playing against Durant, and, and he did an excellent job at making his life difficult all around the floor. Uh, what, do you, what do you guys think about that game? Was that just an outlier? Was that something that, that we can expect from him on the defensive side? Uh, you know, there's obviously some weaknesses there, but he I does mean, have some skills there. I mean, I, I, I think what he showed was a strong heart. You know, he's a guy that's going to play hard on defense. Um, you know, this is a guy who, who he's not going to take anything for granted. He's not a star. So he, when he's on the court, he's going to give it everything he has. But but no is the answer to your question. We can't expect him to be able to guard um, primary scoring threats um, throughout his career. He's just not that type of player. Uh, it was a great game. It was a great game for everyone. We're, you know, that's defensively. Now, what he did offensively in that game, um, and that was the birth of Wancholand, the the three from the from the right the right wing. I believe he hit like six threes in that game. That we can expect. Um, this is the type of guy type of guy who when he gets hot he goes thermonuclear. So yeah, I don't be surprised to see him have games where he drops twenty to thirty points out of nowhere. But I would be very surprised to see him consistently having games where he's guarding guys like Durant effectively. Yeah, piggybacking off that, Wanch is just a he's a high energy guy. And if his energy's on, he's going to be able to do stuff on both ends of the floor. And that would, the Wancho and Murray were a bit of a fresh air last 
year, I think, when they came in and played because they're high energy, they're fun to watch, they're fun for the fans, and they bring an energy to the team that they don't they didn't really have last year. So I'm just excited to see those guys get a bigger opportunity this year because they both both Murray and Wancho both bring energy to this team that they haven't had in a long time, and it's uh I think it's really exciting to see. It's really exciting for all the Nuggets fans and uh, something to watch going forward for sure. Yeah, I stand. I stand a little bit different. I, I really. I, I'm not going to say that he's going to be able to lock down those premier scores all the time, but I honestly think that he's going to develop into somebody who can be very pesky on the defensive end. I mean, not positional wise, but kind of like a Patrick Beverly, where it's just annoying to be guarded by him because of that motor you were talking about, Brendan. It's just he's always going. He has heart, you know, and he's not scared to to go down there and and you know take a beating if he has to. So. Um, I, I think I think his offense is something like you guys were talking about that's just going to come natural. I think his defense is going to be one of his biggest upsides that he's going to bring to this team in about you know maybe two or three years. If he becomes a two-way player, man, then I think we're talking about maybe the third most important young player on this roster over Jamal Murray. Um, so yeah, it's just you know it, it, on the off chance you're a non Nuggets person and you're catching some of this podcast, like when people are talking about the young the young guns in Denver, you're gonna hear Harris, you're gonna hear Murray, you're gonna hear Jokic. Do not forget the name Hernan Gomez. Yep, that's the boy, good old Juancho. Yeah, ah, get all excited about Juancho. Like you were saying, Brandon, <laughs> his shot is absolutely fantastic to watch. It's beautiful. Oh, it's awesome. I could watch him shoot all day. Good stuff there, gentlemen. Good stuff there. Let's go ahead and keep it on moving. Um, so let me ask you guys a question. For all these lineups that we've been talking about, different rotations and players, everybody knows that the Nuggets are one of the deepest benches in all of the league. It's They're fantastic, you know, from 1 to 16. is all have some potential there and uh, all have really good fit, all similar types of uh, of uh, play that they like to, uh, you know, run with each other. So what, what are you guys some of your favorite lineups that you're excited for? What do you think are going to be some of the most effective or – you know, what, uh, what What are you guys thinking about the rotations in the second unit and third third rotations? I'll, uh, I'll, let, I'll let it go to you first, Brennan. To be honest, I know it's the starting lineup, but I'm really excited to see how the starting lineup works. I'm really excited to see the Millsap-Jokic combo. I think we're in the, the early stages of their relationship. We've seen a, a bit of a mesh early, a bit of uh, guys messing up a little bit. I think uh, – I'm just excited to see the whole Millsap Jokic thing, how it, uh, because Malone said that he's going to run the offense through both Jokic and Millsap. So, uh, Brendan, I know you talked to uh, Jokic the other day. You got him uh, after practice. Would you say anything about the combo he had with Millsap and what the relationship was kind of like moving forward? He, well, the context was, you know, with regards to Malone's comments about maybe dialing back Jokic's touches because there's a guy like Mills up there. And, you know, I asked Jokic if he was concerned, and as you would expect, he literally shrugged it off. As he said, you're going to get your chances. If, if the ball is right there at the rim, it's yours to grab it and score. So he, he sees having a guy like Millsap around as nothing but a blessing, a guy who can do the things he can do, um, just another guy who can get it done. I think, you know, early in this preseason, man, we, we haven't seen them mesh the way we know they will eventually, but that's like not even registering on my radar of concerns. It may be clunky for the first couple of weeks, but by the end of the the first half of the season, we're going to be talking about one of, if not the best front courts in the league for sure. Exactly. That's why I'm excited to kind of, that's why that lineup's kind of the one that's most exciting for me because it could develop into one of the best passing front courts in the NBA and they're going to make a lot of highlight real plays, especially with Gary Harris and his cutting ability. I just did a player breakdown on Dig in Denver about Gary Harris, and I talked about his cutting ability and his relationship with Nikola, Nikola Jokic and how those guys really work well as a one-two pair, and then you add in a guy like Paul Millsap. It's only going to make this offense more exciting, and Paul Millsap really brings that edge on the defensive end of the court. We saw that a few times this preseason, especially in the Golden State game, a few of the Lakers games. He had some really important key blocks that really sprung some fast-break points, and I think that's a uh, Millsap really brings an extra passing ability, an extra scoring ability, and he brings that defensive upside that this team is really looking for. So the starting lineup for me is going to be that most exciting lineup to watch, especially just at the start of the season and see how those guys kind of connect as a whole. Uh, Brandon, help me out here. I'm trying to think of the the lineup that was on the floor in that OKC game in that great stretch in the third. It was Will Barton at the three, Wancho at the four, and Millsap at the five, right? Um, and I believe he... 
Right. And he brought Jameer in and he left Gary in. So I think you were looking at Jameer, Gary, uh, uh, Barton, Hernan Gomez and Millsap. Um, yeah, that's a fun lineup. That was the third quarter was exciting. Yeah. And Will Barton gets hot like that, man. It's, it's fun to watch when right. he's making shots. It's a, it could be big for the second unit to have a playmaker like that who can just create a shot whenever the team needs a bucket. And I think that's what Will Barton brings to this team. hundred percent. Now any lineup is fun to watch when a guy gets three and one layups within a span of like five minutes. So this is a, a bit of being prisoner of the moment, but yeah, that was, that was a bunch of fun. Um, I really liked that lineup and I was there for that game sitting near the, near the court. So I'd like to see that one out there again. Um, but, but yeah, to, to Brandon's earlier point, to, to the point that Malone has brought up at practice time and time again, super deep team, a lot of interchangeable parts. So um, here's a cop-out answer, Derek. I'm looking forward to finding out what various lineups will be most exciting to watch going forward. Yeah, um, I think my favorite lineup moving forward is going to be one that, or most exciting, I guess, moving forward would be one that I don't even know if we're ever going to see this year, but... A super young team, I think, with the the five of Murray, Harris, uh, Wancho at the three, Lyles at the four, and Jokic at the five. The oldest of the five barely still getting used to the bar scene. I think that would be a really fun lineup to watch, and I think those five would work really well together as a unit. A lot of the a lot of movement going on with that, and every single one of those uh, five able to shoot the three. You could not help off off your guy off of any of those guys so i think that lineup would be really lethal from the three-point line and just act activity in general i think that one would be a really fun one to watch uh, as they develop as a team i think that's exactly what um denver's thinking as well man and you know like the light in the light in draft pick is confusing and you know within the context of missing out on og and mitchell and stuff it's rough but yeah that's that's sort of what they're thinking of, right? Three, four years down the line. Imagine Jokic in the high post with those shooters surrounding him. Granted, that team would be dreadful on the defensive end, but yeah. And then you got, you know, young Malik Beasley, who will, you know, remain an afterthought on this team with all the young stars they have. But yeah, he would be a part of that that six-man rotation as well. So I'm with you, dude. I mean, the future is is bright in Denver, to say the very least. Poor Malik, too, man. That, what a talent. I If that kid had the opportunity to go play somewhere where he was getting tangible minutes that were actually helping him develop as a player, I, I, he has so much upside in my eyes, just his athleticism and his ability to shoot and spread the floor. Uh, I, I wish we could – I wish we had room for him on this team. I was I was sitting there thinking the same thing at practice today. I was watching shoot around at the end, and so I asked Malone that question. I said, you know, with all these talented guards on this team, how much – Beasley can Nuggets fans really expect to see um he conceded that we're probably not going to see him this year you know it's just going to be tough to get him on the court but his eyes lit up man when he start. you know it's it's the coach has to do these things right but when he started talking up Beasley um he said look what I, I can confirm that this is an NBA player I think this guy has the right motor the right work ethic to be ready to go whenever he's called upon um but you know, it's, uh, he, he has the potential to be a great NBA defender. So Malone is just as high on Beasley as the rest of us. But yeah, you know, as a non as a non ball handling guard, it's really tough to see a future for him on this team. Yeah, it's unfortunate for sure. But, uh, you know, uh, hopefully we'll we'll catch glimpses. There'll be some injuries, of course, there always are. And, you know, some some sit out. So we'll, we'll, hopefully we'll get to see him a little bit. Um, how much how much time is he going to spend in the D League or sorry, the G League? Well, he's, he's, um, I think he'll be on the team this year. I, you know, for, for, I think we'll see him on the NBA roster for most of the year. Um, I just don't know how much we'll see him in the game. So. But touching on, moving on from that guy there, touching a little bit on the Millsap and Jokic uh, pairing that you were talking about, Brandon, what, uh, what was your final grade of them in the preseason? What were some of your thoughts to kind of summarize what happened in the preseason so far, what you've seen in practice and in the games? I would just give it a solid uh, solid B to like a C plus because I just don't think we've seen what they can be yet. Just uh, through their first training camp together, only five preseason games. You saw glimpses of the ball movement, uh, their fit together, and then you saw moments where the offense was a little stagnant. You know, we didn't – it wasn't flowing like it usually is. And that's something that comes with time because – 
it's something that comes different because they're going to play through Jokic, obviously, but they're going to play through Millsap a little bit too. So like Brendan said, Jokic is obviously fine with that, but still takes a little adjusting too, especially with adding such a star like Millsap. So I just give it a solid B, C plus, and it's a, I think it'll only go up from here though. I don't think the pair is going to get worse at all. I think that they're only going to improve and I think the starting unit as a whole will improve offensively and both defensively because I think Millsap does bring that defensive energy, so hopefully he can get Jokic going. Uh, you know Gary's going to bring it on the defensive end. You know Jamal's aggressive. Uh, Wilson's as steady as can be. So uh, I'm excited to watch the offense, obviously, because they're one of the best offensive teams in the NBA, but I'm excited to watch the defense, especially between those two in the front court and the havoc they kind of caused down low. Yeah, how many pokeaways did we see uh, Gary and Paul have in the preseason? Like the hands were so active. Everybody, Will was in the, getting in on the action. Like just the aggressiveness and the ability to start taking away passing lanes could be could be huge for this team if they can continue to to rise that side. Yeah, like I said earlier, guys. You know, I didn't. They didn't really look great, um, but I, I couldn't be less concerned. Does that make sense? Like it, the two two guys who who have almost identical games outside of Millsap's defensive prowess. So it's like, yes, they fit beautifully together in theory on paper. But again, these first couple of weeks, they're they're going to be going to the same spots on the floor almost. I know they play different positions, but they think the same way. So it's been really clunky. Um, neither you know Millsap hasn't shot the ball particularly well yet. But yeah, like I said, um, it's happening. Um, the, the, you know, they'll mesh, so don't have to worry about it at all. Yeah, I agree 100% with you. I think that if that's our biggest problem is our two best players and our two smartest players having a problem with each other, I know they'll figure it out. That's not anything that Nuggets fans need to be concerned about. Yeah, when I keep hearing uh, all these articles uh, about the pairing and not meshing how we thought it would be at first, uh, a lot of people have been making a lot of light of that, but I don't think that it's something we need to worry about. Might be a little shaky at first, but down the road, that's going to be a great pairing together. I think uh, we can all agree about that one. Fantastic, gentlemen. Yeah, nothing, nothing too crazy there. It's everyone's been talking about it. It's been something that's been pretty obvious so far. One of the most talked about things of this offense so far. Um, but what was the final? What were your What were your thoughts, Brendan, about the the preseason overall? What did you see from the team? Um, one thing that I had noticed was the defensive end really starting to step up a little bit as uh, compared to last year so far. Um, what, you know, what do you think of the preseason so far for the for the entire Nuggets core team? Okay, if I had to give a grade, I would say a B minus. Um, turnovers are down, but they're still too high. Um, the interior defense was awful. They made an adjustment the last two games, but then the perimeter defense was awful. Um, offense looked good against Golden State. Backups looked great against the Lakers. Um, offense looked really, really bad against the Spurs and the Thunder. So I'm going to give them a B-. minus. Um, but I am higher. Like, that's a B- minus that that doesn't worry me. Like, I, I think this is going to be a very good team. Um, I think, you know, for me, it's like best case scenario, six seed, worst case scenario, nine seed. I don't know about what you guys are thinking. That's about in the same range I am. I was, uh, I'd give the, uh, I'd give the, uh, preseason for them. Uh, I'd give them a solid B. My biggest concern with the preseason was the turnovers. Uh, they had a lot of turnovers in all five of the games and that's just when the offense seemed clunky at times and they were forcing it a little bit. It was both Moutier and Jamal and some of the other guys, but, as a whole, I thought the offense looked like it usually does. I thought the defense looked good at times. I thought the defense looked good in the Warriors game. Both Lakers game, obviously, I thought they were aggressive, but it kind of took a downward spiral in the Spurs game and then at the end in the Thunder game. But I really was impressed with those first three preseason games, especially the Golden State game. They started off hot. They just always seem to play the Warriors well, and that's exciting because uh, the Warriors are always somebody that fans like to see your team beat, and that's exciting that the Nuggets can do that. But I'll just give it a solid B. I still think the defense needs improvement. I think the offense is there, but it's obviously going to get better. And then if they can cut down on the turnovers, that will cut down on opponents' fast break points. That will allow them to flow more on the offensive end so they score more points. 
So uh, a big thing for me going into the season is turnovers, and uh, hopefully they cut down in that statistical category. Yeah, I think that uh, early on in the preseason and early on into the regular season that we saw last year too, it, it was tough with the turnovers. Uh, we got better as the season went on, uh, even though it was still a problem near the end of the year. But one of my th- biggest takeaways from the preseason is we shot an average of uh, 42.2% from the three-point line. That's up 6% from last year in total. I know it's a small sample size, but even with those last two games shooting very poor from the three-point line, still overall shooting 42.2% is amazing. And that's only 1% less uh, than we shot from the field, shooting 43% from the field. So I think our three-point shooting, I know we're expecting it to go up this year, but I think we really shot well in those first three games especially. And if we can shoot like that, during the season, we're going to be a really tough out, even for teams uh, that have uh, four superstars now, like the Warriors and the Cavs and all those super teams. Uh, they're not going to be able to keep up with us if we're shooting like that. And then my other big thing in the preseason that I was excited about was how Mason Plumley was playing overall. He struggled a little bit last season trying to get into our offense and learn the offense, but I think he really felt a lot better having an offseason in Denver, and he shot 68% from the field during preseason, and I thought that was huge for him, and that was something that not very many people have been talking about, and if he can be that successful for us as our backup five, that's going to be really good for us, and to have a guy that can back up Nikola Jokic that well, it's going to be tough when he's going against the other fives in the league, the other backup fives that aren't as good as him we're going to really have the advantage at that point. That's a really good point. I'd like to second that, actually. Um, The effort he put in on the boards was incredible. I mean, that's what you need out of your backup center, right? A guy who's going to come in with fresh legs, so just fly around. And Mason's a big, athletic dude. So, yeah, he he played great. If he can live up to that contract, which is a big if, but if he can, um, then Denver's in a great spot. Yeah, I just want to piggy. I just want to piggyback off uh, Plumley a little bit there. I was, I was really impressed with Plumley, and I thought uh, we saw the player that we thought the Nuggets were trading for last season. And uh, I talked to Plumley in training camp, and he said he obviously talked a lot about how being here with the team, going through the whole training camp, playing in the preseason was going to make him a lot more comfortable with the guys. And uh, like we were talking about Wancho earlier, him and uh, Wancho showed some good chemistry in the preseason as well. They threw Plumley threw Wancho a few lob pass dunks that Malone talked about after the game, and he was impressed with. And uh, Plumley's energy on the defensive end of the court is another big thing. He's uh, he was the best shot blocker the team had last season. He led the team in blocks after he got traded here, and uh, he had a few blocks in the preseason. He even blocked a three point shot at the top of the three point line. I was pretty, I'm pretty sure it was one of the Lakers games, but uh, the energy he brings on both both ends of the floor, his creativity. He's just another player that makes the Nuggets front court deadly in terms of passing. They almost have the best passing front court in the NBA, in my opinion, with Jokic, Millsap, and Plumlee coming off the bench. And Lyles, too. Lyles can play make a little bit more than you'd think at the power forward position. He has, he has excellent handles, for sure. Uh, people were pretty critical about the Plumlee contract that was signed, you know, as far as the, the dollar amount. What, what do you guys think about that? I was critical of it at first. Um, I, you know, as it's been explained to me, I do understand the sort of need to look, let's just, um, let's show the fans and the players a commitment to what we have. Okay. We like the team we have. We think we could be really good in two or three years. So they're obviously just doing everything they can to lock it all in place. Um, Mason, who is a guy who, you know, is comfortable playing you know a backup center role who will play as hard as he can every night without demanding to start and um yeah so you see that concerted effort to lock down harris obviously barton is next up uh mason's lot to i think it was a bit too much i'm not sure like who whom else they were bidding against you know that's the big thing for me um so yeah i didn't love the contract but i i'm i'm certainly not against the idea of bringing mason back i think he can fit quite well in this team 
Exactly. That was kind of a big thing for me too, is the, the timing of the contract. Like if that contract herp- happened earlier in the off season, you would understand, you know, it's a bit of a bidding war. There's other guys that want him, but since it happened so late in the off season and just a couple weeks before training camp, I think that's kind of what the staggering thing was about when you saw it was three years, 41 million, but the contract as a whole, I don't hate. I think he's a good fit with the team. I think that after getting the whole training camp in the preseason, like I said, with the team, it's only going to help and the fans will see his value here. And uh, as a whole, I don't think it's going to be a terrible contract. I just think the timing of the contract so late in the offseason is kind of what threw people off guard. I also feel bad for Mason in so far as I think his entire tenure in Denver, unless something, you know, miraculous happens here, like an unprecedented championship, you know, unexpected championship run in the next five years or something. Like he will always be associated with A, that contract and B, that Nurkic trade. And it's like, so I would stress to remind Nuggets fans throughout this process that like maybe the contract doesn't work out. 100% the trade was horrendous. Um, But Plumlee himself has been good, you know? And so like, you know, so don't, don't, don't hold it against him that perhaps the front office sort of botched these situations. Well, and I had a lot of people that were that were talking and asking me. They're like, "Oh, you know," they're just talking about how how quote unquote botched it was. How come you know what was the whole thing? And I said, "Well, he just wasn't he wasn't doing anything for Denver. He had you know, for lack of a better term, he'd given up. He had stopped playing. There's multiple incidences of him actually leaving during the games, and there's a lot of tension going on with the with between the front office, the players, and him. So it's just it's one of those things where it may not have been the best trade, but." for the oversight i think it was probably the best thing that denver could have done at that time yeah i mean nurkic had to go and they were never gonna get a star back nor did they really want one right because the problem was they needed a guy who was willing to play backup and and do it give it his all so Plumley was the right guy it's just that they attached a pick to a better player and sent them to their division rivals who ended up leapfrogging them for the final spot in the playoffs only because they now had Nurkic. So yeah, that is as bad, a, a, you know, a literally worst case scenario for a trade. But yeah, just, I would stress that the trade was a bad move. The contract is questionable. Plumlee is an awesome dude and a great fit. And he's going to give it his all here during his Denver tenure. Denver tenure. Yeah, agreed. Agreed 100%. So, so, Brandon, let me ask you this then. With everything we've been talking about, what uh, what's your oversight for this pre- this season coming up? What you know, how many think, wins do you think we're going to get? The win total for me is probably going to be around in the forty five to fifty range. I think this team can really get there. I think that a big thing last year was obviously just those few close games where they just couldn't sneak it out or they blew a lead late and they just couldn't finish. I think that this team, from everything I've seen so far, has that ability to finish games and get over the edge and make their first playoff appearances in four seasons. And, but it's something we're going to have to, it's a wait and see. It's wait and see when they get in those close games, who takes the last shot? How do they defend on the last play of the games? Cause they, they can't afford to have those games like they had at Memphis last season when Memphis got the ball with 0.6 seconds, they lob it up to Gasol over Freed and he finishes it. They can't afford to lose those type of games, especially in the Western conference with how much more tough it's going to be this season. So um, I put the win total in between 45 and 50, and it's really just going to come down to finishing games and if this team can really take the next step to be a playoff basketball team. And I think they have the ability to do it, but it's something we're going to have to wait and see a little bit. I think it's going to be somewhere in between 45 and 50. And I think the biggest thing about closing games this year is going to be uh, I've I've been a little bit critical about how Malone – uh, de- uh, gave the ball to certain players at the end of the games. I feel like you give the ball to your best player, and last year our best player was Nikola Jokic, and he never really got the ball in those last few seconds. I think we need to really push the ball to him in the low post. He was the second best uh, player in the post all of last season, efficiency-wise, and we didn't give him the ball uh, when we needed to score a bucket. And I think even with the addition of Paul Millsap, when I first heard that we got him I looked up some highlights of him and he made a couple game winners last year and I think he could potentially be a guy that could take shots for us as well but I think we just need to get the ball into the right hands at the end of the year or at the end of the game sorry and not just give it to one of our guards and let them kind of shimmy shake and, t- and throw up a, 
wild shot at the end of the game. I think we need to drop a play to get it to our best player in a position where they can score. Yeah, I think this team is yeah. is uh, probably going to win 47 games. That's my guess. I'd like to um, toss any of my predictions out with an entire shaker of salt, though. Like, you hear these numbers from, like, Matt Moore and Zach Lowe. Like, they went through the schedule <laughs> with strengths of, you know, strength of schedule numbers, and they, like, actually determined what their win-loss total might be. I look at things on the internet and I make slight adjustments. So I'm seeing 45, 46. I think they're going to be a little better. Uh, I have them at 47, but I acknowledge the worst case scenario. Like defensively, it could be awful. Um, they're counting on, on big leaps, you know, continued production from Harris and Murray. Um, but you know, pr- progression, player progression is not always linear. Um, and it's not guaranteed. So yeah, this team could could miss the playoffs, man. They could, uh, or they could mess around and grab the sixth seed. So um, you know, I feel good about it. I think they're a better team than like Portland, than Utah. Um, I don't know if they're better than the Clippers or Minnesota. That's sort of where I'm at with it. Yeah, it's it's so many variable outcomes. Me and Logan have this conversation all the time that nobody really wants to talk about it, but there is a there is a reality where the Nuggets don't make it in. You know, it's, it is a ridiculously tough uh, uh, conference this year. And so with all these variables that are in place, you know, and, and a lot of it's given, too, that the Nuggets are just going to have a great offense because of how good it was last year. You know, I asked Logan, too, just to ask the question, you know, what happens if they don't mesh? Not that I, I think that's a high possibility. It's, it's obviously probably more probable that they will actually click and everything's going to be just fine. But in that worst case scenario, you know, how far do we dip? How hard is it to get into the playoffs? And it's just it's a conversation that nobody wants to have. And, you know, it's uh, it's not a fun one, but it's you know, a possibility out there for sure. Um, so, so in your eyes, Brendan, what's, what's that one thing that's going to propel this Nuggets team to actually make it into the playoffs and, and making some noise? So, uh, there's been a lot of talk, I think, like for some reason there's our, we've arbitrarily picked league average. I guess it's not arbitrary, but people say this defense needs to be league average or better for them to make the playoffs. I don't actually know where that's coming from at all. Uh, last year, post the Jokic takeover, December 15th, as we all know, number one rated offense in all of basketball, including Golden State. I believe it was a bottom three rated defense. They still only missed the playoff by one game, and that was with injuries to Harris, injuries to Moutier, injuries to Fareed, injuries to Gallinari. Um, I don't think this team needs to be league average defensively. They just need to be – they can't be 30th again. You know, um, that I don't think that's too much of an ask for this team. I think you have Wilson Chandler, who's in a starting position where, by the way, a lot of people don't know this. Look up Wilson Chandler's score in production. He is a much better scorer and much more important part to an offense than you'd think. So just as far as replacing Gallinari's production, but he also won't have to with Millsap and Jokic there. He's the kind of guy who they can sort of ask to, to maybe just step up and guard the Durants of the world. Um, no one can guard Durant. Wilson Chandler, when he's defensively focused, is an excellent defensive player. So I think Chandler and Millsap alongside of each other, not league average, but maybe low 20s, you know what I mean, um, in that area for defense will be enough to get them through. The offense is just going to be too good, and uh, you're going to see a healthy Jamal Murray. I think if you have a healthier Nuggets team, you're just going to see the continued uh, progression of this team you know, picking up where they left off post the Jokic takeover. I totally agree there. I think the, uh, you know, the offense, offense is going to improve. We're hoping the offense is at least top 10. We hopefully top five in the NBA defense. Like you said, if it can just get into the low twenties, that's uh, all they're asking for. But a big thing for me to have a successful season and make the playoffs is that start. It's those first 20 games to start off fast. And then they're, uh, They open, obviously, Wednesday against Utah. They come home for two games. And then they have a bit of an East Coast road swing there. They got a four-game East Coast road swing that they play Charlotte, the Hawks, the Nets, and the Knicks. All four winnable games. So it'll be interesting to see how they handle that first East Coast road trip. And then in the first part of November, they play Toronto, Miami, 
and Oklahoma City and Golden State all at home. So the way they handle that first road trip and that first big home stand in those first 20 games is going to be a big test for the team to start the season. I think if they start off hot, that gives them momentum to carry out through the whole season and ultimately help them make the playoffs once again. Uh, I, you know, you keep mentioning getting off to a hot start. I agree that that's important because the back end of their schedule is ludicrous. Um, those final few months will be as difficult for Denver as any other handful of teams in the league. Um, so yes, I agree with you, man. Uh, get off to a hot start, stay healthy, stay healthy. As we go through December, January time, the guys start to get a little tired. We see bodies hit the floor. Um, the Snuggest team is good enough, man. The Snuggest team, you know, if everything goes according to plan, they are absolutely a playoff team. So it's about minimizing those disasters, avoiding those injuries, et cetera. Their schedule's a little back end heavy last season, and those few games at the beginning of the season they wish they would have had at the end. That's kind of what bit them in the back after the All Star break. They didn't have a great start after the All Star break. They just got to avoid those little stretches where they just can't figure it out. And I think that's really what's going to help propel the team and take the next level, which is the playoffs. And they have to win those gimme games, okay? So when you find yourself playing Brooklyn, playing Sacramento, you need to come away with a win because it's not just the top of your conference that's loaded. It's your division. Every game in that division, including Utah, is going to be a challenge all season long. So, yeah, you got to play well enough in that division, but also you got to buy yourself some breathing room. You cannot blow those games to those Eastern Conference teams. you got to win them. Fantastic, gentlemen. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you guys. It's uh, it's going to be a fun season. Some great things to look forward to for sure. Um, any other last uh, thoughts before we wrap it up here? Uh, oh, hey, I'll just say this. I think the Nuggets are better than Portland. I'm sure we all feel that way as somewhat Nugget fans. Um, but, you know, those two teams seem to always be compared. They're rivals. Now Nurkic is on the Trailblazers. We know how the, the finish went down last year. Uh, I think Denver objectively definitively leapfrogs them this year for sure yeah that's one of the matchups that i'm most excited for it's either going to be the blazers because we're starting to have like an actual rivalry rivalry where we just don't like each other or else the timberwolves just because of the talent matchup and and how fun those two are gonna be to watch bash but uh that's definitely one of my favorites it's gonna be that portland matchup oh, and and carmelo back in okc and Russ hitting those game winners last year and Russ trying to murder Jokic for no reason at the start of that preseason game the other night. Um, that's another potential rivalry. So a lot like a lot of like personal beef here with the Nuggets. It's like I guess that's just what happens when you get good. You get automatically taken as more yes. uh, more uh, of a yeah. threat. <laughs> that's a good sign. That's a good sign if you're registering on other teams radars. I like it. Well, exactly. Like it. They're registering nationally, too. They got a uh, 15 national TV games this year. They got a. Uh, I got it right here. They got four on ESPN. They got five on TNT, and then they got six on. I don't know. Not everybody has NBA TV, but they got six on NBA TV too. So nationally, they're starting to gain some attention too. So those big nationally televised games, it'll be interesting to see if they come out. And I think a few of those are Portland and OKC. So those will definitely be fun to watch, and everyone will be watching them. So hopefully, they come out and show well. And I, I think that dynamic makes this an especially important season for Denver. Not just basketball stuff, but like. This is a t look. Denver is not a small market. Denver is a phenomenal sports town, and yet, guys, the Nuggets dead last in attendance in each of the last two years. They almost never get a star through free agency. So um, they got one in Millsap. Granted, he's not the sexiest name. He is a star. They've got you know a budding. They've got a core that's ready to explode. They've got national articles about them on ESPN comparing them to Golden State. Like this is the chance for Denver to hit the scene and become relevant. Um, and it's starting to happen nationally. So the Nuggets have to capitalize on this to develop some sort of local momentum behind this team. Because I just moved here, guys, and I do not see enough Nuggets jerseys out there in the streets. This is the first time for a lot of these guys that they're not going to come in underrated. A lot of these uh, people have been saying that we are going to get that six seed, and that's, that's I think, on the higher end of what we can do. A lot of people making that guess, making that assumption on us, uh, provides a little bit more pressure that a lot of these guys hasn't, haven't had. A lot of our young guys like Jokic, Murray, Harris, we haven't really been looked at as a team that can make the playoffs. And now that we're looked at like that, it's going to be exciting to see how they respond and how they're going to move forward with a little bit more confidence behind them in the city of Denver and nationally as well. It's going to be a good time for sure. Well, 
Guys, uh, I think that's all we have for this episode of the Dig in Denver podcast. I want to thank all of the uh, guests that hopped on with us. Of course, our newest co-host, Brennan. Brennan, go ahead and tell people one more time where they can go ahead and find you at. Hey, follow me on Twitter at BVOGT422. Follow the site account as well. That's at Dig in Denver. And make sure you head on over to digindenver.com. Check out all that fresh written content. Excellent. Then make sure to get on over there, everybody. Brandon, tell the good people where they can find you at. Just find me at uh, B Skip Seventeen with an underscore there, so it's B underscore S K I P one seven. We're excited to cover the team, and it's uh, going to be a big season here, digging Denver. We got some big stuff planned, no doubt. As always, good people, you can find me at Digging Derek on the Twitter. Make sure to go follow our Instagram page as well, putting up some cool videos, pictures, other stuff like that. Uh, and then you can catch me and Logan here all the time whenever we decide to podcast and listen to our beautiful voices. So just want to thank you guys one more time. Excited for this season. Be looking for a weekly podcast. We'll be make sure to get it out, whether it's myself, Logan, or Brennan hosting it. Make sure to get some uh, special guests on the show as well and get some awesome stuff out there for you guys. Uh, thanks a lot, gentlemen, for your time. I appreciate it. You guys have a good night. Let's dig in. You wanna be the champ, you're more like chief some shit Big up myself every time when it comes to this MCs be running scared as if they watching the exorcist I kick more game than a crackhead from Hempstead My style's a milk, man, you think that I was breastfed You know the stealer when the dicky dog is on the scene I dedicate this to all the MCs out of